information resources and faster and more reliable technology. Higher performance communication resources and faster and more reliable. I'm talking about patch management. Woohoo! I uh, think some of you would rather be going to a dentist or, or a root canal. Sounds pretty appealing at this point, but I am going to talk about patch management and a new way that, uh, that a new methodology that I've used in the past that's been very successful on how to do patch management a little bit different. Uh, so here's a kind of an agenda of what we're going to walk through. A little bit about myself. Okay, uh, I work for Protivity, and Protivity offers uh, we're the old Arthur Anderson. We we traditionally do audit and consulting services. We have an IT uh, part that uh, handles IT security. So I'm a QSA auditor. I go out and do security assessments. We do NIST cybersecurity framework. Uh, and then we also help you with remediation. So I come from, I'm kind of new to the world of consulting. And in my role in past organizations, I was over patch management. In some of the organizations, I had over 6,000 servers that I had to, that I was in charge of keeping, of running a patch and vulnerability management program for. As you can imagine, patching becomes a full-time job. And it, it, whenever you say the word patching to a sysadmin, all of a sudden he's going to have flashbacks of late nights, energy drinks at 3 a.m., and a nightmare of having to roll patches back because stuff broke. So commonly when I go out to see, see organizations, organizations I would say, Typically, they will patch every single month, but typically once or twice a year, they have to roll patches back um, because of compatibility issues. So according to uh, HP's brand new paper, their cybersecurity paper that HP just released, they don't like the current state of patch management either. I think it's funny that they would use such strong words like, while it is laudable, with laudable, that Adobe and Microsoft both releases patches at any point in their history. So basically, it remains unclear if this level of patching can be continued, can be sustained. So Microsoft on average right now is averaging about 100 to 150 security patches per year, per year. And from a testing and a, a de deployment standpoint, this is time consuming. This is expensive to organizations and also risky, because when we, whenever we make changes, it introduces risk to the organization. Also, we find out that the most commonly breached security hole today is the same hole that it has been for the last five years. We are not patching, and because we're not patching, hackers are lazy. We're gonna use the same tricks that worked yesterday, we're gonna try them again today. And because of that, it's still working today because companies find that patching is too difficult, it's too complicated, and it's too costly. So when I go out and do an assessment against an organization, I find very levels of patching maturity from a walk into an organization and they do absolutely no patching and what I commonly hear is, we can't patch here because it breaks stuff. Then I'll walk into an organization at the next maturity level and they'll, they'll basically say, hey, I'm gonna turn on auto updates. I'm not gonna do any, any type of patching, testing or anything. I'm just turn on auto updates. But there's no management of that. There's no reporting. There's no maturity around that. And it's typically only around OS patches. It's not around third party patches. It's not around any of that. Then we get to a level where I'm gonna use WSUS. I'm gonna have this centralized uh, infrastructure now and I'm gonna control patching. But this doesn't address third party patching. This is like Java and Flash, all these other products that have to be patched. So 
then I'll see a maturity level of, well, we're going to have, we're actually going to patch and we're also going to purchase a vulnerability scanner like Nessus or Nexpose. And we're actually going to scan our entire enterprise and keep track of our missing patches and our missing vulnerabilities. L little something I've learned over the years. When you run Windows Update and Windows Update runs and it says, I installed this patch, all it does is it actually when it says it install a patch, all it does is it goes and flips a couple registry key values. It doesn't actually validate that the install was correct and, and the, the DLL versions and the libraries were actually updated to the right version. So commonly when I see an organization go out and do a vulnerability scan for the first time, the, the vulnerability scanner will come back and say, hey, these servers aren't patched. And the admin's like, well, we applied the patch to it. Well, it doesn't, not necessarily, because it doesn't mean that the, the patch was installed correctly. So it's important that you do validation with a, a vulnerability scanner, scanner or using Microsoft MBSA to actually validate the patches are installed correctly. Now, lastly, we'll all see this complete program, okay? That we're we're going to patch every month. We're very mature. We have a process down. What I'm introducing today is, is a six bullet point at the very bottom uh, when we talk about evolving to the program to a point where you only have to patch a couple times a year instead of every month. So we, we talked about there's several risks just, just by applying a patch, okay? So typically, why do patches fail? When I deploy a patch out, why does that fail? The number one reason is the lack of testing. So typically, IT departments go out, they, they go out and see, oh, we need to deploy these patches. Uh, I'm going to deploy it to a, to a test server or a couple test machines today, and we'll see if it really breaks anything. Okay, it didn't break anything. Let's go ahead and roll it out to production. Well, that doesn't mean that they, they thoroughly tested all the features and compatibility of the entire application. Also, the second most common reason I see is when we, when we do reboots. When you reboot a box, it doesn't always come back. And even more so when it's a physical server. If you re when you reboot a physical server, it's 10 times more likely not to come back than, you know, if you didn't reboot it. So that's when failures occur is, is on reboot. So you know, we talked about that IT, we lack the skill set and the tools to adequately test patches. So to properly test a patch, most organizations have a, a, a software development department. And in that software development department, typically they'll have a QA department. And the QA department was really good at writing test case and they're really they have great tools to actually test the features of of an application but IT usually handles our own testing of a patch we don't have the skill set in the IT department we need to, to mature our IT departments to have the, these the availability to the tools to not just be able to be able to test every feature of a box to simulate what a user does simulate a uh, uh, an average user opening applications, actually loading a file, making sure that the file loads correctly. All this can be scripted and it can be automated. It doesn't have to be time consuming. I find that, that with through automation, you can reduce the amount of, of testing that it takes by 70 to, to 85% if you do automation. The other re common reason that I see patches fail is you deploy the patch out to all these servers it worked great in testing. I had no problems, but the second I put load on that server, all of a sudden the CPU spiked after I applied that patch. We don't test, we typically do not load test when we deploy a, a patch. So we need to mature our, our programs to the point where, hey, we're gonna, when we test the patch, we're gonna simulate actual load so we can really understand what this is going to do. The problem, though, is if we increase our testing, it's, it's going to increase our cost to deploy the patch, and it's also going to increase the time for us to deploy the patch as well. 
So cost and time to deployment increases. But on the other side, it reduces risks. So it's risk to the organization for business disruption. So comment, we talk about costs and risks. Should, should the business make this investment? And should, what is the risk to the organization if we don't? We talk about this all day in CISSP classes. Risk to the business. You have to make patching a, a risk to the business. So most organizations I go into, I ask them, I say, okay, for you to, to patch once a month, what, how much does it cost your organization to deploy a patch every month? And most companies cannot tell me the cost to patch. If I'm gonna write a business case to an organization whether I should patch or not, I should understand what the cost is to the organization to patch. Okay, so, so typically I need to, to understand these variables of typically, uh, I keep track of these matrix every month. How many hours did it take me to test? How many hours did it take to deploy? How many hours from various business, to, business units did it take for them to validate? Traditionally, uh, I also track the number of times we have to roll back patches every year. So typically in most organizations, I would uh, patch failure rates are between five and 10%. If they patch every month, one to two times a year, they're gonna have to roll back some patches. Track that information. You need, you need to understand that information so that you can build the business, ca business cases of when to patch. Now when I look at, when I'm trying to assess whether I should patch or not, we need to understand the severity of the patch, okay? And we, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk about a lot about using compensating controls to remediate patches, okay? But when I look at compensating controls, like say uh, a network IPS or a firewall, when I look at these things, I don't care about them anymore. I don't care about a firewall. I don't care about an IP, uh, IPS anymore because the most common way breaches are occurring today is through pivot attacks. So we look at the target incident that, that occurred at target. They, they were able to breach a heating and air conditioning desktop machine. And then they use that to, to attack another desktop. And then they use that desktop to attack a server. And then a cash register, a point of sales unit. So all of a sudden you have these pivot attacks that are coming in these attacks are coming from the inside of the network, not from the outside. So when I'm assessing the security of, of a server, I do not take into account perimeter security because most attacks now are coming from the inside. So let's talk about this concept of risk-based patch management. Most compliance programs like PCI compliance, regulatory compliance programs like High Trust, HIPAA. If you read through the programs, they all will say, a lot of them will say, do you apply patches monthly? What is your, what, what is your policy around patch management? Most companies say monthly. But they also will say, do you patch monthly or do you have a risk-based patch management program? When I ask people what, what risk-based patch management programs mean, I get a hundred different answers. So let me show you what my definition of a risk-based patch management program is that I've, that I've deployed before. So we're gonna talk about comp compensating controls on a server. So a server will typically have antivirus. It might have it, memory protection like Microsoft Emmet. It, it could have a host firewall, it could have a host IPS. These are all secure, it might have application whitelisting. These are all security layers that are on the server itself. Okay, and so if I tried to exploit that server, it would have to go through every one of these layers to be able to exploit. And as that exploit travels through these different layers of security, it's going to interact and it's going to change the behavior of that exploit. So even though Microsoft comes in and says, hey, this is a high vulnerable, this is, this is high severity. But when I actually try to exploit it on that machine, it's not a high severity. 
because my, my host IPS picked it up and it stopped that exploit from occurring. And so since it stopped it, it's not a high severity anymore. I can reevaluate the risk because I'm going to assign, I'm going to now track, hey, this exploit can be stopped by this uh, compensating control. This, this, this security product here stopped this exploit. So when we, uh, when we do assessing on a box, we, we're going to talk about two different things. We're going to talk about vulnerability scanning. We're going to talk about penetration testing and exploitation. Okay? So typically, vulnerability scanners that you use today like Nessus, Nexpose, these are all vulnerability scanners. What they do is they, they look at a box, and they, what they're looking for is like DLL versions, uh, they don't actually try the act actual exploit. They say, based on this DLL version, your server is vulnerable to this exploit. It doesn't try the actual exploit. It just, it just evaluates what you could be susceptible for. Okay? Now, a penetration test or an exploitation software like, like Metasploit or Core Impact, that's going to go out and actually try the actual exploit. Big difference there. So uh, penetration test actually tries the actual exploit and sees what I can actually do with that exploit. C can I get a shell access? Can I take control of the whole desktop? Can I pull data out? It just, I need to, I need to use both tools. So my approach to, to patch management is there's varying phases to, to the approach to a risk-based patch management program. The first phase is the inventory phase. I need to understand what hardware is out there. I need to understand what software is out there. I need to understand where the sensitive data in the organization exists on the network. And then I also need to understand the impact of that system. If that system goes down, what is the impact of the organization? Because not all servers are created equal. If I bring down a database server, it's more than likely going to have a much larger ramification than bringing down a, a, like an app server. The next phase, when you, we've talked about the importance of testing and how it, important it is to test. But if, if you work in an environment that has 5,000 servers, you cannot do 5,000 test cases. That's too many things to test against. It would take you literally months to, to deploy patches because you would have so many test cases. So you want to be able to reduce your test case down. So what you want to do is you take your servers that have the same footprint, the same applications loaded on them. So you have a bunch of web servers. They, they might be different web servers, but they have the same version of Tomcat on them. They have the same exact version of, of of all these different applications. So they're, they're configured identically. I mean, they, they have the same vulnerabilities on them. If I, if I conduct a vulnerability scan on these two different systems and they're exactly the same, they're configured the same, I'm going to lump, lump them into, my, into their own test group so I can reduce the number of test cases. So I've been able to, to, to successfully go from over 5,000 servers to 50 test cases. So I only have to test 50 test cases now. I don't have to do 6,000. Now the next thing I do is I perform that vulnerability scan we talked about earlier. And what I'm looking for is not just miss missing patches. When Microsoft releases a patch, it, doesn't, it, it can contain multiple exploits. So exploits are usually tracked by CVE numbers. So a common vulnerability exploit, there'll be a, an actual number for it. So if you look at a Microsoft uh, patch, it might contain 10 different CVE numbers. So what, we're, what we want to do is we want to look at the server and say, OK, tell me what, what CVEs is, does this server, is it vulnerable to? I need to know a list of those exact CVEs. Because what I'm going to do next is I'm going to take that, that list of CVEs now and plug it into my penetration testing software. And I'm going to point my, my penetration test 
ser- my penetration test tool to that server and say, okay, the vulnerability scan said it's, it's, it's vulnerable to these things. I want you actually to, to try to exploit that, that small list. I'm not, I'm not talking about testing hundreds of thousands of different exploits. I'm, I'm taking a small list of maybe a couple hundred exploits that I'm testing against. The goal here is to be able to automate this and to automate your testing. So you're going to go out and actually exploit that. The next step is what you're going to do now is when, that explo- when, when those exploits ran, you need to capture the log files from your very various compensating controls on that server. So you need to look at the, the AV logs. You need to look at the, the log files from your host IPS, the log files from your application whitelisting. And look in those log files and see where it stopped that vulnerability. Which, which of those caught that vulnerability and stopped it? Or which one changed its behavior? So, uh, for example, I, I, I only get partial access to a box instead of full access to a box. I, I no longer can get root because one of, my, one of my compensating controls changed its behavior. You need to be able to create a, an in, uh, a list. I, I track a, an Excel list of CVE for each server. Each test group, I keep a list of CVE numbers and then exactly that are that the vulnerability scanner says I'm vulnerable to, and then I keep a list of exactly which compensating control caught them. Because w- the end of the day, I need to be able to go to an auditor like me. I'm a PCI auditor. I'm a QSA, and when I come in and do a QS, uh, when I come in and do an assessment at your organization, I'm going to ask you, show me a. I, want, I need to see a list of, of vulnerabilities that your box is currently vulnerable to. I need to see the outputs of a Nessus scan. So I'm going to take a look at that Nessus scan. And what you can do is you can come to me and say, okay, here's, here's a list of vulnerabilities that this box that Nessus w- showed or Nexpose showed. And here's a list of the exact compensating controls that stopped each one of those CVEs. You have to be able to demonstrate to me, the auditor, that those compensating controls worked. So you have to keep this evidence for an audit. Now, there's always a big question, who should decide when to patch? Typically, the IT department or the information security department will will say, hey, we need to patch now. But should we? This is, we're talking about spending money. We're talking about spending resources. In most organizations, they, they holistically will track the, the risk of an entire organization. So they're out there, they're going to, uh, the, and typically it's, the risk committee is, is, is fronted by the uh, CFO. And the CFO will look at the, the risk to the business and what it costs to fix those particular risks, to remediate those risks. We, when we take this approach of understanding what the cost is to patch and we understand what the risk is to the business, we can have discussions with people like the CFO and say, okay, here is the actual cost, here is the actual risk. Here is the percentage, we can look and see what the percentage of the, the likelihood that it's going to be in, uh, exploited. We can tell you exactly what the impact is if you exploit these particular servers, okay? So typically, I will write now a business case to the business saying why we need to make the investment to patch. It's fascinating when you, when you change the methodology of, of going from, hey, this is just regular maintenance to this is a business decision that the business has decided to deploy this patch. This is a business decision. All of a sudden, I was, it, it became a hundred times easier for me to go to the business and get support from the business to patch because this was a business decision, not an IT decision. Uh, it was phenomenal, phenomenal change in the, in, in the way that the business perceived patching because this, this, was, a, this was a business decision to, to reduce this risk. So we talked about this. Treat it as a project. When you treat patching as just regular maintenance, I find that organizations, they, they get halfway through their patching cycle, they never really finished it, 
And so now they, they really have these, these clusters of servers that could never be patched. And so, and we lose sight of these patches on these, these special case servers. So typically, that's where the, 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 the hackers are going after. They're going after these systems that for some reason or another have never been patched. But they don't, we don't even track the compensating controls on these servers either as well. So even if they have vulnerabilities, we're not tracking how we're, how we're gonna, even though we've made a, bit, a decision as an IT department not to patch these servers, we're not thinking of ways to, to compensate for, for not patching. So one of the big challenges that, I've, uh, that I had when I used this method was coming up with an a test environment that accurately represented my production environment. And it can't just be, well, it's a VM. Okay, because we're gonna do load testing. And when we understand load testing, we need physical, we need hardware that can have the same capacity of, of production. Even in the cloud environment, okay, if I'm, if I'm gonna spin up a cloud environment, uh, a cloud instance in, in AWS, I need to make sure it's spec the same so that I can put the same amount of load and make sure that I, I have all the same dependencies. I can't just spin up a local copy of the database on that web server. I need to actually have a database server that I can, I can load test against. So we talked about the importance of automated testing. So I've been able to, like what I talked about before, I've been able to reduce the, the, the number of hours that it took to patch. So I worked in this organization. It was, it was costing us $100,000 every month for us to patch. That's $1.2 million every year. That sounds like a huge number, but this wasn't a huge organization. This, it is not uncommon for, for companies between two, one, and 5,000 employees to be spending this kind of money and labor every month on patching and support calls and, and help desk technicians to support this effort, it adds up quickly. And so the more you can, you can reduce the number of times you have to patch and reduce the time it takes to test the patch and the number of times you have to roll back from the patch is going to save you money. I got a little, little excited. I talked a little fast. Um, you know, so just to wrap up, some key takeaways of, of what we talked about today. Uh, once again, my name is Adam Steed. Uh, if you saw my talk last year on, on why I love LinkedIn and using why I think LinkedIn is, is a better pen testing tool than, than InMap, go ahead, please go ahead and link me in. Uh, my name's Adam Steed on LinkedIn. Go ahead and link me in. I have a bit really large network. I love hard questions. Uh, if you have questions around PCI or, or coming up with, with a remediation for this audit finding, feel free to hit me up. I love hard questions. Does anyone have any questions around this? Go. So what I did is I says, okay, if we're gonna change our methodology, we need to increase, when we do patch, we need to dramatically increase the amount of, of testing. So I took them the number of hours for, for testing that we were spending per month and I doubled it, okay? And then I also doubled the amount of documentation. So from a monthly cost perspective, when we did patch, it was costing us 40% 40, 40 more money for us to do a patch. Uh, so we were investing more money when we did. We were just doing it less often. But the, what's that, go ahead. You 
you have to pay someone. Eventually, you're going to have to pay. But can you reduce the number of times you, you have to pay? At the end of the year, I, I can tell you flat out, I was spending a lot less at the end of the year. But you bring up a great point. I've increased my dependency now on my tools. I need to make sure my tools are healthy and they're running. My, because now I'm very tool dependent. So, you know, the point I want to make is this doesn't work in every organization. I, I think there's use cases that it is better. For the most part, there are, it's probably, it's, for most organizations, patching monthly is a better, better way to do it. I'm just saying that in certain, certain use cases, it, 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 it doesn't work. For example, w I've been doing a lot of work out at a hospital, and they have all these medical devices, and, and the medical device manufacturers will only approve, they have to prove every OS patch that is applied onto a medical device. And they, they will only approve those patches a couple times a year. And so I physically, I can't patch those devices every single month because the, the manufacturer says I can't. And I, and I often will see that on appliances as well. When, when a vendor strips you an appliance, their appliance, uh, they will only allow you to patch it when they, when they bless it. So any other questions? Cool, thanks guys, appreciate it.